mindset of the next person is the understanding that we, as the disciple of Christ, are responsible to raise up that next person to deliver and to continue to pass on the faith so that the faith to Jesus Christ will continue going on through all the earth. Whatever way that God has choose you in your, in your station of life, in whatever that you do as employees, as business owner, as, as um, what is it, mother, or as a housewife, God has a special place for you to be a mentor to bring up the next generation. We established that last week. If you missed last week's sermon, uh, you will be able to find it in IFG Penol website under sermon. And we say that last week, the making of a, the rise of a mentor, pretty much mentor is like a tour guide. That's the summary of last week's sermon. Because mentor bring whoever that is next into spiritual places that the mentor has already been. It's very simple. Just bring people along your journey. We established that last week. So this week, I want to continue the discussion about mentor and mentee. mentee. And so uh, let's see, where is my... All right, the making of healthy mentee. Everybody say healthy mentee. <laughs> what does mentee mean? We will find out more. But before that, I want to tell you a little bit part of my nice thing, journey, because I've been in the last week, I also share a little bit about my sabbatical to New Zealand and to uh, Australia. You know, one thing that is nice when you travel and eat in the restaurant in New Zealand or in Australia is there is no tip. They don't require tip, right? Even in Indonesia, they did not require tip, but nowadays, they add service charge automatically, right? And it's different here in the U.S. Those who visit the U.S. from Indo, they always kind of, they are not used to the tipping. But the culture of tipping, I feel, in the United States is getting worse nowadays. Like, it's almost like not, not voluntary, but an obligation. I feel that. You know, one of the uh, social media posts from this uh, company or this restaurant, okay, it's kind of uh, making me think a bit. This is what they said. We at Fire Grill understand that time are a little tight right now. For a lot of people, our serving staff included. Our girls make $3 an hour. This is in the state of Tennessee. In California, it's 15 bucks, you know, but Tennessee is, uh, you know, uh, not not as liberal and not as uh, punishing as California to us. They work hard and they run their legs off for people. Why is it that people have the audacity, the boldness, the uh, keberanian to not tip them? I know you're getting good service. Maybe you should consider not going out if you cannot take care or tip of the person taking care of you. They depend on tips for their pay. The workers in the service industry need to make money too. They have bill kits, car payment, etc., just like everyone else. Stop being so stingy. Tip your servers. What do you think of this? That's right, right? I mean, since when tip is obligation, uh, you know, to for the you know, I mean to, to, to pay the worker. I mean, they don't pay Living wage, well, you know, then <laughs> the employer, correct. I am with you with that. But at least this post uh, make me think. You know, I mean, like when we go out and eat, as a customer, we engage in transaction and enjoy the service. But simultaneously, when we settle our bill, whether through tipping or we just pay, actually, we indirectly assume the role of employer. Right? I mean, when you, when you pay for a service, you are actually paying for the cost of the goods plus the labors. That's how they charge. 
So at the same time, we are customer. At the same time, we are also employer. I mean, I, you know, I don't... Maybe they have a reason, the, the restaurant, to make that statement because people probably don't tip enough and their employees complain, but I'm with you. I think uh, employer should pay the living wage. But I just want to see this from the concept of dual role that we take in the marketplace. We are both customer and employer. And I think this is a better model when we talk about mentor and mentee. Because these are dual role that each one of us, the disciple of Christ, takes on. We are both at the same time mentor and mentee. Mentor is someone who guides. Mentee is someone who is guided. And at any time in our discipleship journey, we are both mentor and mentee. But a lot of people do not think of it that way. There is a mis misconception that if you want to be a mentor, you will have to go to a remote place, find a certain sifu, and then train yourself, and then come down from the mountain, and then start practicing guiding other people. I think you watch too much movie. The underdogs movie, you know, like usually, um, I, I'm thinking about uh, Karate Kids. Oh, this is too old for a lot of you. How many ever watched the movie Karate Kids? Okay, those of you who do not uh, raise up your hand, probably you are young and, or, or you actually watch the movie, but you don't want to raise your hand because you will be thought as, as very old people. But yeah, Karate Kid. But I think right now in uh, Netflix, I think there is Cobra Kai. How many <laughs> watch Cobra Kai? Okay, or, oh, Daniel, okay. <laughs> but it's a similar concept. You know, Karate Kid, uh, a guy, underdog, was bullied by, by uh, another person and then met the Sivu, Mr. Miyagi, you know? I mean, remember the story, right, Miyagi? And then he, you know, go uh, uh, to his, his house and train and train and then after he's ready, he will come down and then beat up all the bullies. That's the... In pretty much the whole story. Or Rocky. How many watch Rocky? This is again, oh, okay, some of you older, even older. Yeah, Rocky is the same situation. Underdog, but then find a trainer, train very hard, running and all that thing, you know. And a lot of us have this idea. If you want to teach someone, you better go out there in the mountain, pray and, and, and meditate and, and let the Holy Spirit teach you all things. And then when you are ready, when you are in the best shape, you go down from the mountain and start teaching people and guiding people and be a mentor. I think that is a misconception. This is not how it works as far as being a disciple and carrying the dual role of mentor and mentee. Because I believe both of them happen at the same time. Then you can, I can prove it to you by looking at the verse of the Bible. There are three examples that I want to present to you today. The first one, okay, that's just my statement. That's what I said just now, which is mentor and mentee. They are at the same time. We are mentor, we are mentee. Okay. Look at the word of God from John chapter 4, verse 28. This is a story of a woman who met Jesus at the well, had a conversation, right? And he didn't know who Jesus was. And Jesus shared about the living water. Maybe you remember the story. And this woman, so excited, what she did was, Immediately after she heard the message that touched her life, the minute after she encountered Jesus, this is what happened in verse 28 of John chapter 4. The woman put down her water jar. So this is the woman from the well who tried to get some water, met Jesus, and went into the city where she came from, where she lived. She said to the people in that city, come and see a man who has told me everything I've done. Could this man be Christ? And people in the city, they left the city and were on their way to see Jesus. So these women bring everybody to see Jesus. And in verse 39, we found a happy ending to that story. 
It says many Samaritan, many Samaritan in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word. This woman has become a mentor for the city. Someone who just interfaced Jesus, who experienced the touch of Jesus, encouraged others to see Jesus also. And, and as this is the lesson that I want us to pay attention to with this story. As I encounter Jesus, I encourage others to meet Jesus also. Because we have a dual role. One more. We read this verse last week. A story about Philip and Nathaniel. Philip was a newly called by Jesus to be his disciple. And the first thing that Philip did when he encountered and being taught a little bit only, because this is at the beginning of the discipleship journey of Philip. This is what he did. In John chapter 1, verse 45, Philip went around and found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then Nathanael, Nathanael did not believe Philip. He said, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael then said, come and see. Come and see. As Philip found Jesus, he bring Nathanael. Philip has become a mentor to Nathanael. One more, okay? One more. One more verse. Timothy chapter 2. Timothy was a pastor in Ephesus back then. Paul, the mentor, wrote a letter to Timothy in Ephesus. And this is what he said. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. This is three generations of teaching. Three generations of mentor. What you see there. Paul, the mentor, taught Timothy, the mentee, who is also the mentor, who will bring others, Timothy's mentees, who is able to teach the mentees, mentees. Can you understand this? <laughs> Where is that? The whole idea is passing on. Paul passing on his knowledge, his impartation to Timothy. And then instruct Timothy, find someone else for you to pass on what I teach you. But not just anybody. Make sure the person that you found, Timothy, is someone who will pass it on to the next person. Simple, right? Not too difficult. Passing on to the person who can pass it on to the person who can pass it on to another person. That's how it worked. Timothy was doing ministry, but at the same time, he is a disciple. He is tasked to be a mentor, to a mentor, to a mentor of a disciple. And so this is my quotable. I come up with it myself. I'm proud of it. So you can quote me. Christian disciples is forged in the midst of daily affair. It is not forged in a mountain. It is not forged in a remote place. It is not forged somewhere that nobody can find them. Christian disciple is forged in the midst of daily affair when we are busy. It's not like, oh, you go to the mountain, nothing else to do, just learn from the Sifu. He or she is molded within the embrace of laughter, tears, joy, sorrow, triumphs, and trials shared among the family and community. How many understand this? This is the place. If you want to learn how to be a mentor, this is the forging place of and purify the gold in, within you the resources within you so that you can be a mentor. You don't have to go 
like me, you know, uh, three months go on vacation or sabbatical to learn from the Lord of the Ring place, you know, and then to be inspired. No, I was going there not to become a mentor. I went there for vacation. You want to uh, be, become a mentor? Be in the church. This is the place. You want to know more about Jesus and you want to grow as a disciple of Christ? Right here, right now, in the midst of us. It is molded in the embrace of your laughter and your Christ and your triumph and your trials. As you walk together, this is the place that God will mold you. Not out there by yourself, right here in this midst of the people of God. Heart of a mentor and a mentee. How do I position my heart so that I can grow? and be molded to be that mentor and mentee, you know, dual role, I was almost calling it mentor, you know, like mentor and mentee at the same time, mentor, but doesn't sound too good, you know, just disciple is better, okay, disciple is better. How do I position my heart if I am to be the mentor that God can use? All of us, we established last week, we are mentor. You may not think that you are mentor. You may not think that you are qualified to be a mentor, but you are a mentor. Last week we established that. How do I make myself in the position of growth? The first one, I want to share only two. Mentee or disciple, yield. Yield. We know that Paul was very well known, very accomplished apostle, right? And he was, and, and his background was like impeccable, like perfect almost as far as Jewish religion. He is the Jews of the Jews, he called himself. He was trained by the best religious teacher. His name is Gamaliel. And so he is the Pharisee of the Pharisee. He is in the upper class of society. But last week, we learned that Paul humbled himself like as if nothing else mattered in his life, he learned from Barnabas. For someone of position like Paul, it takes him to yield his heart, humble himself, wanting to learn even from Barnabas. A lot of us, God placed in the high places or will place in the high places. Do not under, underestimate yourself. Yes, you probably is just an employee right now. You feel like you are nothing. You are just starting out. You're just student. And you think, ah, you know, like I probably cannot accomplish much, you know, in, in life. But I think differently about you. Jesus think differently about you. You are meant for greatness because the Holy Spirit inside of you is there. But some of us who are already think ourselves very smart and, and rich or whatever, if you are to be successful, to be mentor, your heart needs to yield. Humble yourself and learn from your mentor, from the word of God. Hello? Can you understand this? This is what Paul said. I consider everything a loss in comparison to the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Did you hear Everything is lost. What is lost? His pride. I'm a Jew of the Jews. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I learn from the best. I'm in high position in society. Paul was. He is Pharisee. Pharisee is top tier in society. His pride. His performance. He's very zealous. He is recognized as someone who produces very fruitful life as a Jew. His position, he lost that. He considered everything a loss, he said. Comparison with the superior, superior value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have lost everything for him. But what I lost, I think of as a sewer trash. What he's saying is, you know, my position, my performance, 
it's like sewer trash. What is sewer trash? You know, smelting things that re people refuse. People don't even want to see here in the United States. They put it underground and then go directly to the garbage dump or going directly to the sewage processing center. Sewage, nobody wants to see that. What he's saying is, those things that I used to take pride on, the minute I know Jesus, the minute I know him, wow, those are just sewage. Is it sewage or sewage? Whatever it is, you understand. Thing that go from your toilet directly to the processing plant. You don't want to see it. You don't want anybody to see it. In Christ, I have a righteousness that is not my own. That is very important for you. I want to drill that inside of your spirit. You have no righteousness inside of your own. You think you are a good person? Paul said, nothing. All you have is sin. All you have is dirt, sewage. But if you know Jesus, that's a different story. In Christ, I have a righteousness that is not my own and that does not come from the law. Being a moral person, that's what it means. But rather from the faithfulness of Christ. Now, this one is a heavy theology if you understand this. He said, rather from the faithfulness of Christ. Huh? Faithfulness of Christ? What about my faithfulness? I'm a good person going to church every week. I'm faithful. But he did not say that. He said, my righteousness come from the faithfulness of Christ. Come on, think a little bit. It's not your righteousness. It's not your faithfulness. It's because Jesus is faithful until the cross, answering the Father's call, because he's faithful in bringing us out from the realm of darkness, we have hope. Our hope is not found in ourselves. Our hope is not found because we are a righteous person, we are a faithful person. Our hope is because just because, just because Jesus is righteous and faithful. Yield your heart. Menti, yield. If you ever want to go anywhere in your discipleship journey, knowing Jesus more, loving God, having that strong relationship as a disciple to your, your God, you need to yield. That's number one. And number two, you need to grow. Menti must grow. What I mean is this. Menti has to seriously invest in their own growth. Growth is intentional. Growth is not automatic other than your body. Probably if you eat, even your body, you have to eat and you want to grow. Grow is, growth is always intentional. It's never automatic. If you don't do anything, if you don't eat good nutrition, if you just left your body laying there on the couch watching Netflix, it will not grow healthy. If you want to grow healthy, you must, you must invest in your own growth. The same with spiritual life. You think by just going to church and check that absentee mark, yes, I present. That's enough? Well, I guess it maintains. And then when the storm of life come, you will be proven weak. You must invest. You must want to grow and invest yourself. A very interesting verse is in Proverbs 4, verse 7. Because Why is it interesting? Because it's kind of like I cannot find where is the beginning and what's the head and the tail on this until you read this carefully. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Hmm. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, though it costs all you have, get understanding. What does it mean? The beginning of wisdom is get wisdom. I mean, if you already have wisdom, why is it the beginning? Right? I mean, think about it a little bit. Think a lot about it a little bit. What does it mean? It means this. If you ever want to be wise, set your heart in acquiring wisdom. If you set your heart, yes, I want to grow. I want to be wise. That is the beginning. That is the beginning. 
if you value wisdom, if you value growth, that is already a wisdom in itself. Be hungry to learn. If you are a mentee and you are serious to make Jesus as the center of your life, by the way, that is a very difficult thing. How many agree? To make Jesus as the center of your life is very difficult. Why? Because so many distractions in this world, so many emergency in our life. How many agree with this? I have to really concentrate, have to pray, have to sit down every morning and, and, and center my life on Jesus. Otherwise, I will be singing that song without meaning it. It's difficult though. You have to learn. You have to invest on your growth if you want to make Jesus as the center of your life. Be hungry to learn. Take advantage of every Bible study, classes, training, and seminar that your own church offer. We train people here in leadership. We have Bible study. We have meetings where the leaders share. Your own church, your own church. A lot of people want to go to other churches to learn. A lot of people just want to uh, hear the hebo, the well-known preacher say very motivating thing. But I propose to you, as in our household, we say mother knows best in cooking, in providing. I do not like vegetable before. I like to go to restaurant with tasty food. But then suddenly, I got diabetes. Who do you think will take care of me? The restaurants or my wife? Who will arrange a nutrition for my everyday life? Certain portion of vegetable, certain portion of fiber, certain portion of protein. You eat it. My wife said. I said, I don't like this. I like sweet bakery. You eat it. You want to live? You want to make me quickly as a widow? You eat this. You know, church is your family. We provide food appropriate for your growth. I'm not saying that you cannot go some other place, uh, some other church to learn and to just enjoy. You may. Some of you are visitors here. By all means, come. But remember, you have to be aware. And this is, I want to give you this wisdom, okay? Every church has different season. You must recognize this. What do I mean by that? Some other church is talking about end time. Some other church is talking about worship. When our church is talking about discipleship and mentor. Now, you do that too often going to another church. Everything is the, church, the word of God. Every, you know, all churches got love. That is for sure. We are all the same. We are all children of God. That's given. I'm not bad-mouthing other church because they have good food. But this, you have to be aware. Every church has their own season. You have to be aware of that. Otherwise, you go here, you go there, you get it. You are never going to be planted, rooted, and grow because the moment that you're trying to get planted in the certain church, you uproot it and you go to another church and you listen to a different message. It's all the Word of God. But how many know that there are thousands and thousands of principles in the Word of God? Which one is for you at this season that you need? Hello? That's why you learn everything from this church. Because this is how you become godly mentor. Godly mentee. We know what you did. Not me, but we. Do you know why we? Because we live together. We know each other's burden. We know each other's struggles. We know the trials, everyone. We are in a care group. We inform one another, this is my struggles. And every month, the leadership of this church pray, and we look at the Word of God, and we always ask this question. I want you to know how we come out with the sermon. How is it relevant to the life of our church? What is the struggle that we are right now facing? 
oh, we're facing cultural war right now in the United States. Our people are confused about LGBTQ, IA, 2S, plus. That's what we're struggling. How do we stand as a, in the church? What is the stand? Are we compromising? Are we not compromising? What should we learn? Oh, our church people are right now looking for a job. They graduated and it's difficult to find a job in this environment. How do we encourage them? We pray about it together in the team so that we can meet your need. Other churches have their own season. Hillsong, always about worship. Nice, blessing the body of Christ. You go there, that's what you're going to get. Other churches, whatever that their season is. You, you understand what I'm talking about? You understand why we need to stay planted, rooted, and grow in your own church and learn from your own Bible study, learn from the leadership training that we give every two months? You understand that? It's for your growth, specific as a member of IFGF Panol. Not grow just in general, I'm growing. In general, I have a lot of knowledge. Where do you apply? Where do you apply what you learn? How do you bring others along in your journey? How many understand the word of God? Hello? You're here? Okay. I have one more, but I'm not going to say it because I will leave this to the care group leaders to explore. I'm asking you today to, be, to carry that duality of role and to understand that you are a mentor and a mentee at the same time. I want to ask this question so that you don't just receive a monologue, but you think about it. What, a, what about the risk of making mistake? Okay. What is the risk of making a mistake? You are asking someone who just knows Jesus, a mentor, to bring another person, a mentee. What about if this person teaches ajaran sesat? What is ajaran sesat? False teaching. What about it? Are you not going to cause a problem, pastor, asking people to start becoming a mentor? It's a fair question. I ask that too. But in the end, I still go ahead and tell you to be a mentor and mentee. If you belong to a care group, discuss this. You need to dig in. What is the risk? And is the risk worth for you to be a mentor? Maybe next week, the preacher will answer it for us. But in the meantime, I want to invite the uh, musician. Um, oh, let me give you the summary of my sermon today so that you see and take home this. Discover the excitement of traveling with Jesus as his heart for others transform our life. Discover, as a mentor, we can be excited in our travel, right? Our dual roles as a mentor and mentee, as we encounter, we encourage. As we find, we share all the uh, word, of, word of God that I shared to you earlier. As we hear, we pass on. Let's all stand.